this whole theme today was about looking at new technologies, but what I'm actually going to, what I've been tasked to do is talk about profiting from existing technology. So I'm not going to talk about UAVs, I'm not going to talk about robots, uh, I'll leave that for the other guys, but you know, I think what I'm going to, what I really want to talk about is what things are working right now for growers, where's some, where's some of the really low hanging fruit that we can, we can actually grab. <clears throat> and I'll start with what's actually been happening in the last uh, 10 or 15 years and you'll see here quite clearly the adoption rates of just a couple of key technologies uh, in agriculture um, and this is only for broad, broad acre sort of dry land farms and you can see pretty clearly there that auto steer uh, wins the race and it's largely was de developed in Australia this technology so it's quite exciting to see now the, the, ma the maturity of that technology now where we've got 75 percent of grain growers actually using auto steer technology in their tractors. Um, the rest of the world's following exactly the same sort of adoption curve. It's very rapid in a lot of areas, especially in North America. Uh, it's, it's very, very rapid. Um, if we look at the next one down the red line, the yield monitoring, uh, you can see the steady, the steady incline over the years of, of yield monitoring. And that's largely driven by manufacturers actually just putting the gear in the, in the machines as people buy it. Um, and so it's not really been a necessary choice by a lot of growers to actually have that, uh, but essentially it comes, it comes in the gear automatically, so people are getting it as they turn over more equipment. Uh, what the, worry, the worrying thing of this is that you'll see the green line, the yield mapping. So it's taking that data from the yield monitor and creating a yield map. You'll see that that's only at 30%. And if we look at true variable rate technology, which is what everyone focuses on in, as, as a precision ag endpoint, is only at about 10%. It's not on that graph, but it's only 10% in Australia. Australian farmers are using variable rate technology. So um, even though you can see the varying fertiliser rate sort of stuffs things up a bit there, that, that's sort of a, a, a thing where people have actually been changing their management based on soil type for many years and have done probably since we farmed uh, thousands of years ago. But when we're actually talking about automatic technology to do that, the adoption rates are very low. Um, so we, we need to understand why that's driving these. Why, why do we get good adoption of things like auto steer? Um, why don't we get so much good adoption of, of things like actually doing yield maps, which is where the profit's really coming from? Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but there's a whole heap of things. And, and the number one thing is we forget about the people in this. And, that's the people we've got to change, and that's what my job is, is basically getting new technology adopted by growers and getting the benefits. So what are the barriers? Um, this, is, this is basically our precision ag cycle that we live by. Um, there's a lot of data gathering going on. As you can imagine, there's lots of satellites, there's lots of viewer monitors running around. There's lots of people gathering data, which is pretty typical for human beings. Um, then, then there's a few blokes trying to integrate things. So you can buy a number of bits of software now on the market to integrate essentially all the data that you've been collecting. The big barrier comes here though is turning that data into some kind of knowledge and intelligence and actually from that making any decisions and actions. And that's where, the, that's where everything's stopping right now. And I guess that's why I've got a business because I take the complexity, trying to take the complexity out of all this and actually turn it into some actions for the grower. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. But there's a massive barrier in this, cut in, in, in this area. And there's so much new technology, so many new things coming on the market. More and more satellites every day, but people aren't making use of that. Let's talk about what is working. And this is where my growers, you know, we've got about 600 growers across Australia now that we work with. Uh, what are the things that are really working for them? And obviously, auto steer is number one. Um, I'm not going to talk about auto steer. I'm assuming everyone's got a fair, fair idea that what auto steer is. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that at all because it's pretty well mature technology in this, in this, in this country. The next big thing that we've seen is, is using that data coming from the auto steer machines to actually generate topography maps. From that drainage and land, land levelling is really accelerating in our business at the moment. Um, you could just about go anywhere from, from central Queensland uh, right round to Esperance and just about everywhere in between has had some kind of drainage problem the last few years from our wet seasons. But most times we do get problems in drainage and it's costing growers a lot of money and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, satellite imagery, it's been around since this, you know, 
60s, 70s, there's plenty of data around, but the use of that data's uh, not been that good. But what we're seeing now is a massive archive of, of satellite image data in, in, uh, that covers Australia. We, we're quite blessed in Australia to have good archives of imagery, and I'll talk about that a bit in a minute. Uh, the fastest growing area of business is verberate liming. Uh, uh, the acidity of the Australian landscape is, is quite stark and in, in WA alone they're talking about about a $500 million or just a bit under $500 million a year uh, lost productivity from, from acid soil. So it's, it's, it's not, no, not rocket science that that's going to that's gonna really drive things and I'll talk about that also. Um, yield mapping. Like I said, people have been doing it for a long time but not many people have been using it. So what have we been doing to actually help people uh, um, get better use out of that data. And finally, the, the, one of the key things that's working is, is variable rate. So people are starting to get to the full action of where they are actually doing some variable treatment now based on site-specific management. So that's really happening. And, um, but again, I don't, I don't think that as an industry we shouldn't focus on variable rate as being the be-all and end-all. It's, it's more about learning about the, pro learning about the farm and, and, and trying to improve profitability on each area of the farm. So I'll talk about those one by one. First of all, drainage. Uh, these guys are what's called having a bad day. <laughs> uh, you know, well, you should, shouldn't have got out of bed in the morning. Uh, but this is the sort of problems that we're dealing with uh, in agriculture where, you know, not only is that causing them a lot of grief for the day, it's also causing them a lot of productivity problems. Um, They've obviously got no crop there and also the other problem is that you can't actually drive through to do any activities. So drainage is a massive problem. T take this guy, we, we, this is just one example uh, from one of our clients in, in the, in, uh, around Ballarat in, in Victoria. So he had this problem and he didn't even realise the extent of the problem until we got some satellite imagery of the, of the property. We took his GPS data out of his tractor, put them together, did a cost benefit on it. Uh, this guy's made 100 grand on one paddock in two years from a $5,000 investment in, in, in some drainage. So the result, you know, the, the profitability of that is enormous and it, we, I've just, uh, it just amazes me that there's not more people focusing on this, this productivity loss from waterlogging in Australia. It's just unbelievable. There's just huge problems out there and um, growers sort of accept it that they've got to deal with it, but there, there is big gains to be made. Uh, jumping on to satellite imagery next, uh, we're absolutely blessed in this country now where we've got a massive range of satellite providers. Um, you know, the stuff on the left is what we all used to deal with with the Landsat back in the early days, but now we've got huge, vast archives of and easily available, the 5 metre and down to 0.5 of a metre, now down to even 0.4 of a metre pixel sizes. And you can see on that one paddock, these three satellites almost went over on the same day, luckily. Uh, and this is one of the fields in, in, in central, Victoria, uh, central New South Wales. And on this couple hundred uh, acre paddock here, you can see there's quite a big variation. And that resolution really does provide a lot more value to the grower. And we can get this now in near real time um, from, from, from the satellite. So within 24 hours, we're getting this delivered and processed back to the grower. And we've now done processed about 7 million hectares of, of, of the high res. So anything from five metres or less, we've started to process quite a bit of that. And people are really using that for their in-crop management. So when you can throw that onto an iPad, drive around the paddock and have a look at, oh dear, I've got a bit of a problem here. So the first thing is about issue identification and, and real-time management. So what sort of things can I do to actually fix some of these problems up? What's actually causing this problem in the first place? Um, unless you start asking questions about that and ground truthing, uh, it's just a pretty picture. And, and that's what people keep saying, oh, it's just pretty pictures, but you've got to get out there and use it. And what we're trying to do is get it into people's hands. So not just uh, sitting on some software somewhere, but onto iPads and into paddocks so that people are actually using it in real time. Here's an example where, you know, these little things that people don't realise that are going on, this is what satellite imagery picked up on, on a guy's property. So he didn't realise he had this big a problem, but until we got the imagery, you can see the striping in that. The black lines represent where the spreader went, and you can see there's just this striping effect. So we just went and did some hand cuts for yield, and. You know, the yield in the good areas is six tonnes and the, air, the yield in the poor areas was four tonnes. So he suffered a $200 a hectare loss just from f the poor distribution of fertiliser. You know, it's pretty simple stuff, isn't it? You know, but people don't even see this in the paddock until you get this sort of data. 
and it's costing them a squillion bucks, you know, like it's pretty simple things to do and they can make big, big changes pretty quickly. I talked about variable rate liming. Um, we've done 40,000 hectares now of variable rate liming in Australia and we, we were the first to import this various technology from the US. Uh, unfortunately, it's a manual machine, which means our lovely, our poor staff members have to press this down every hectare. So our guys have actually done 40,000 now samples in the field. Um, and wonder why they whinge so much about, uh, they got sore arms, I couldn't work out why, but when it got 40,000 times, it's pretty, it's pretty daunting. But what it does is it takes a sample uh, and just measures the pH, the acidity, every hectare. And you can see on the left there a grid of what we'd normally do, a grid pattern, a bit like the US does, but we just do it in the field. We then calibrate that back to with lab results, so we're getting good, good correlations with the lab. So we can confidently then go and apply lime uh, for acidity uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a variable, variable fashion. And this is just one example, and it's, it's the best example. Of course, I'll use the best example, not the worst one. But most of the time, we're seeing this massive reduction in lime use because people have not recognising the spatial variability of the lime. Oh, sorry, of the acidity. So um, this guy um, had an 80% lime saving, which saved him 140 grand. So it's pretty big numbers uh, for a guy's bottom line. And I was just zooming around Google the other day, and sure enough, there's the farm. And so all the white areas there are, are the areas where he actually applied lime, and the rest of the farm didn't need it. Uh, and it's just a simple fact of measuring this stuff in the field and ground truthing and, and then helping the guys apply that in the field. Because that's the next step, is that's been automatically applied by a, a spreading contractor. He didn't have to change the rates or anything. So that's the, what I'm talking about, getting it to an action. Um, yield variation. This still irks me. Why, why on earth have we got 60% of growers got, got yield monitors, only 30% even, even looking at the yield maps? This is not uncommon. This is, this is a paddock uh, in New South Wales where it's no different to any other paddock that we work with in Australia. There's at least three to five-fold variation in, in yield in every single paddock on Australian grain farms. There's very few that have less than that, very few, and sometimes even more. I've got a guy on the downs that had tenfold variation in yield in one paddock, tenfold. Where do you think our productivity is going to come from to, to feed this magical however many billion people? Like if, if we can get rid of these low productivity areas, uh, we're going to lift our productivity really quickly. And it's sitting right in front of us. We've got a three to five fold variation. This, like those red areas there are less than 1.5 tonnes per hectare and, and, the, and the blue areas are over three and a half tonnes per hectare. So if we can just simply unlock the yield of those red areas to match the blue areas, then we're, we're, we're going to make a big profitability. And, I had a grower ring the other day and he said, I've worked out how much this is going to save me, uh, make me. It's 200 grand on his farm, he said, per year. Once I work out, he's worked out how to unlock those, those poor performing areas. 200,000 bucks a year. So he hasn't bought any more land, he's just done a lot better job. And this is one example. Once we do get good yield data, over many years we can start to stack all this information together and look at which areas are performing above average, which areas are performing below average, and start to really drill down on those parts of the farm that aren't performing. Of course, you know full well that those red areas are going to be subsidising the, the averages of the field, aren't they? So we've got to really drill down. Once we've got this information, get out there, ground truth, find out what's driving these factors. Is it waterlogging? Is it soil type? Is it something else? Is it nutrition? Is it disease? And really starting to investigate what that is. A more forensic agronomy approach to the way we look at it. Um, this is an example where variable rate management can work. Lachlan Caldwell is one of the agronomists we work with uh, um, in Grenfell, in New South Wales. He had this paddock on the left where you can see the quite big variations in yield um, on that field. And he did some determination about what those factors were. It was a soil type difference. He changed the seeding rates on those sandier soils. He changed the nitrogen management in crop on those sandier soils. And the resultant map the year after, uh, you can see the evening up of that farm. So he hasn't done any soil changes at all. He hasn't modified any soil. He hasn't brought any more soil and done anything else except change the management of that crop, change the agronomy of that crop to actually bring up the evenness of that paddock. So, and that's what I'm talking about. And I think that's what we can achieve with good partnerships with agronomists, with technology companies, um, and, and using spatial information. So what are the next steps? Um, I think 
there's big opportunities coming. There's new satellites now that are going to talk about multiple capture times per day. So we're talking about satellites that are low orbiting that will capture data multiple times. Even video uh, delivered within 20 minutes. So I don't see a much future for UAVs, to be honest. Um, I'm a bit of a UAV sceptic and I'm, I'm almost getting tired of UAV companies ringing me saying, I've got the greatest UAV ever, I just need some farmers. And I say, welcome to the real world, pal. You know, like, it's unbelievable. Uh, I think that, yeah, that's going to be a real big rationalisation in the next couple of years, but I might be proven wrong too. Um, there's a massive amount of remote diagnostics now. So I can buy units now that will track every single machine and everything that no goes on about that machine remotely. Uh, or you can either buy it aftermarket or every single tractor that comes on the market nowadays has got a SIM card in it. And the reason is that they can just do remote diagnostics, remote tracking of that machinery, uh, and remote repairs essentially on that gear. So that's really exciting. And once we start to pull all this data together in a cloud, uh, we've got some really powerful data. We've got to bottle this intelligence. We've got to make this data, um, we've got to make this data work for growers. We can't have, um, I, I guess I've got to do myself out of a business because we can't keep, we've got to get this process quick, you know, sped up so that we can get this uh, value from, from data. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is big data. So everyone's talking big data at the moment, but what, what, what goes into big data is small data. We've got to know everything about every square metre of land in our farming enterprises. We've got to make every square metre profitable. So, but that, the good thing is that's, that ramps up to big data, where we can actually see region-wide and, and, and sort of farm-wide um, analysis of data is going to be really powerful. Thanks very much.